So this is a collaborative effort between several um, nonpartisan community organizations. Um, the, uh, the organizations involved have been the ARC, which is a Jewish action in cha Champaign-Urbana uh, organization. We have the League of Women Voters, also of Champaign County. We have Epsilon Epsilon Omega of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, also in Champaign, Urbana, um, and Danville, and Savoy. And then also sponsored by Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church. All of these organizations believe in um, encouraging active participation in the voting process. And one of the things that we all wanted to do was make sure that we help to inform and have um, uh, an educated electorate. Um, we can't possibly have people who vote know who they're voting for without sharing information. So this evening, we are continuing that effort to share that information with you. Um, the webinar, so let me go to the next one. So right now, the order of the evening will be welcome. I'm in housekeeping and I'll share a few other items with you this evening. Then we'll have our guest speaker, Professor Steve Schwinn of University of Illinois, Chicago School of, of Law. And then we'll have questions and answers, a question and answer session. Uh, Professor Schwinn is perfectly okay with um, taking questions as he presents. And so even though technically we usually wait to the end of the evening to go through questions, he's comfortable with if you have a question, put it in the chat. Um, right now we're asking that you send that, um, you direct that question to Diane or she will be looking in the chat to make sure that she has all the questions. And then those questions she will share with Professor Schwinn. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the webinar participants will all be muted. Um, and so you'll only see Mwah! and Professor Swin, and then Diane towards the end when she'll do the question and answers. All of the, this webinar as well as past webinars are being recorded. And so if, if you see this and you think it's such a wonderful thing and you want to see it again, or you want to share with other people and let them know um, about the webinar, we'll give you that information at the end to let you know how that you can um, view the webinar either again or share it with other people. Uh, let's see, I do believe that's it. So let me go into my introduction for Professor uh, Schwinn. In addition to his faculty role, Professor Schwinn is a frequent commentator on the issues related to constitutional laws and human rights. He serves as an editor of the American Constitution Society Supreme Court Review, an annual publication reviewing cases and issues at the Supreme Court. He is a member of the Board of Advisors for the Chicago Lawyers chap Chapter of the American Constitution Society. He also works with area school teachers, students, and nonprofits on outreach and public education related to the Constitution. This evening, he will clarify recent Supreme Court actions, update us on the status and possible future of federal and state voting rights legislation, address how redistricting and gerrymandering affects voting rights, and provide concrete suggestions for actions that we can, uh, we can take to support voting rights. And so without further ado, I, I pr present to you, Professor Twin. Mariel, thank you so much. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Thanks, so. Yeah. And the, the video is okay? If we experience any, you just froze on. I'll just ask that you please drop me a note in that, and I'll be happy to make adjustments, whatever. You okay, just froze. awesome. Oh, I just froze. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I've, uh, I've already gotten some messages uh, that my internet is unstable for some reason, which is really odd. I'm here at school, uh, where the internet should be strong. But if there are problems, please just let me know and I'll be more than happy to make adjustments. Sometimes um, I have luck if I turn off my video. Uh, so that may be an option as we go through this. So Muriel, again, thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for inviting me tonight. What a great pleasure and honor to be with you. This is just such a thrill. I really do appreciate the opportunity to spend an evening talking to you about voting rights and constitutional and statutory law, some of the attacks on voting rights that we're seeing across the country, what the federal government might do about it, what the law has to say about it, and what we, the people, might do about it as well. As Muriel suggested, I'll be happy to take questions as we go through. Um, if you please just want to drop them in chat. I don't know in this format if there's a 
if um, if folks who are designated attendees can uh, speak up or turn on their viewer, um, if that's a possibility, we'd be happy to hear from you in person. If not, chat will do. I put my email in chat. I'd be happy to talk to you offline as well. Um, so, uh, so please let me know. And I'm seeing uh, a note in chat right now uh, addressed for the People Act and John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Okay, I see. Thank you. So, yes. Yeah, so, for participants, if you have any questions or comments along the way, please drop them in chat. We'll make sure that we get to them. And then I'll reserve about 30 minutes at the end tonight, maybe more, uh, depending on how things go. Uh, for open discussion and open Q&A. Again, my name is Steve Schwinn. I teach constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and human rights at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Law. I've been doing this kind of thing for about 20 years now. I've taught at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Law for uh, hmm, 14, 15 years. I was at the University of Maryland School of Law for about six years before that. I've also taught at the University of uh, George Washington University Law School and American University Law School. Uh, before I came on into teaching, I was in practice in the general counsel's office at the Peace Corps, but I, um, I get to keep my hand in practice as a teacher doing all kinds of pro bono work and uh, pro bono work around constitutional rights, voting rights, human rights, and the like as, uh, as I go and try to get my students involved in those things as much as I possibly can. I, um, as, um, as Muriel uh, introduced me, I am actively involved in the American Constitution Society. Let me just say a beat on that. So ACS is a um, organization that works to promote a progressive interpretation of the Constitution. You may have heard about the Federalist Society. The ACS is sort of the progressive answer to the Federalist Society. Now that said, I am actively involved in the schools. I do uh, a number of media appearances. I edit the Constitutional Law Prof blog and am involved in other public education efforts, including through the American Bar Association and try and hope that I can present a kind of um, politically neutral, let's say, view of what's going on, but at the same time, a realistic view of what's going on with regard to voting rights at the Supreme Court in constitutional law, in Congress and in the state legislatures and what the outlook is uh, for voting rights. I will say just by way of introduction, in setting up this session, we were kind of chuckling at the crazy number of issues that we have to cover and deal with and this very sort of odd confluence of politics, separation of powers, federalism, fundamental rights to vote, uh, racial discrimination, disability discrimination, and, uh, and more that kind of come together when we talk about voting rights in, in our current political climate. It really is just dizzying. And so I think part of my job tonight is to try to sort that out a little bit, try to give a kind of framework for thinking about these different issues and, uh, and project forward based on what's going on in the state legislatures and the litigation that we're already starting to see, challenging state legislative restrictions on the right to vote in Georgia, in Texas, in Kansas, and many, many other states. As you undoubtedly know, there are uh, a number of states, hundreds of uh, voting rights restrictions that are either in the pipeline or have been enacted by states. The Brennan Center, uh, if you don't know the Brennan Center, the Brennan Center out of uh, New York University Law School does an outstanding job collecting all this information. And I would uh, urge you to take a look at their website if you're curious about what different states are doing. But about 48 different states, that is almost every state in the union, has considered or adopted some restriction on the right to vote. And again, there are about 400 of these either working their way through the pipeline or now in action. You might have seen that Governor Abbott just signed the voting restriction bill that was working through the legislature in Texas, just signed that yesterday, and litigation is already underway in the state of Texas. Advocacy groups have already filed claims that we'll talk about a little bit later in the session to challenge that Texas law, just as we've seen challenges in many of these other states. So we might say, well, what's going on here? 
Largely, I think what's going on is a reaction to allegations of voter fraud in the 2020 election. We heard widespread allegations of voter fraud in the 2020 election that invited state legislatures to enact restrictions on the right to vote. Now, there is something else going on. In the 2020 election, you might remember, almost every state legislature or every secretary of state opened up the right to vote in the state in order to accommodate restrictions based on COVID. And so, for example, we saw much more mail-in voting, much looser rules on mail-in voting and absentee voting, rules keeping the polls open longer in order to accommodate distancing, for example, uh, and, and other uh, traffic concerns, people traffic concerns at voting sites in the 2020 election. And so what we're also seeing in some of these states is a kind of rollback of these measures that were expanded in the COVID period and rolling them back in the name of preventing voter fraud or voting, avoiding voter fraud and ensuring the integrity of the vote. Along with that, states commonly assert an interest in sort of um, assuring the electorate that there is no voter fraud and that the right to vote is secure in the state. What I thought we'd do tonight is talk a little bit about kind of the history of voting rights in our country, the constitutional law, the statutory law, and how that overlays with what's going on in the states today, and then project forward and think about what's likely to happen in the courts, and again, what we the people can do about all of this. And again, I invite you to um, to drop questions or comments in the chat, and I will pause occasionally to allow you to do that, just to make sure that we're keeping up with them. Um, and then again, we'll reserve some time at the end to go ahead and do that. I do see, and I wonder if somebody can help me with this, I do see an indication that an attendee has a hand raised, and I'm not sure what to do about that. I saw that too. And so I did send her um, a, a notice in chat to ask her, does she have a question? Oh, I see, Muriel. Oh, okay, great. So, yeah. Thank so, so. Yeah. So, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in chat and chat, we'll yeah. get to it right away or loop back and make sure that we get to it before the end of the session tonight. Okay. So I got to say, I struggled a lot thinking about where to begin with the session tonight. And I ultimately decided maybe we'll just begin at the beginning and think about how we can categorize voting restrictions in sort of, let's call them three dimensions. So one dimension deals with the right to vote, just the fundamental right to vote. We know that we have a fundamental right to vote under our constitution, although it's not specifically stated in the constitution. We know from the text and the history and the fact that we live in a Republican democracy, we know that we have a right to vote. And we also know that that's a fundamental right. So in this first dimension, what we wanna sort out is how do the courts treat this fundamental right to vote? And what does that mean? with regard to the state legislative efforts to restrict the right to vote. So that's one dimension, just kind of a fundamental right to vote. A second dimension is racial discrimination in the vote. Racial discrimination in the vote. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we dive into that dimension. But here, what we're talking about is state legislative efforts that restrict the right to vote based on race and seek to disenfranchise individuals because of their race, most typically because they are a voter of color and our country has a long and ugly history of discriminating in race on the right to vote. And we'll talk about how Congress has reacted to that and how the courts have reacted to Congress's reaction to get a full sense of what the state of the law is today. So second dimension is racial discrimination in the right to vote. The third dimension that we'll talk about tonight is, um, is districting and, uh, and drawing legislative districts, state legislative efforts to draw legislative districts, and in particular, their efforts to gerrymand 
legislative districts, to draw legislative districts in a favorable way, either based on politics or based on race. And I hope to share with you a little bit about what the law has to say about redistricting efforts in the legislature, which obviously is quite timely, and, um, and how, uh, how we might think about challenging district efforts. Um, to gerrymand, either by political uh, affiliation or by race. So we could also talk about other dimensions in the right to vote. If, and if anybody's interested, I'm more than happy to do this. Let me just mention one, for example. Campaign finance is a, to a really hot topic with, with a lot of uh, sort of complications and problems itself. And I would count that as a potential fourth dimension that we could talk about again. And I would invite your questions or comments on that and happy to say a few words on that if you would like. So these three dimensions, what we've seen the Supreme Court do in each of these dimensions is really restrict the fundamental right to vote and restrict plaintiff's ability to lodge legal challenges against state efforts to restrict the fundamental right to vote, to discriminate by race in, uh, in voting practices, and to gerrymander districts both by race and by political affiliation. In other words, we, we've seen the Supreme Court do is limit the law, the constitutional law and the statutory law in a way that, um, that upholds state restrictions on the right to vote and actually invites further restrictions on the right to vote. But in order to see all this, we really do have to begin at the beginning. So let's rewind and <clears throat> sort of talk about some fundamental distinctions before we get into this first dimension, the fundamental right to vote. So what I wanna do is introduce you to the idea of um, impediments on the right to vote in different ways that a state legislature might impede the right to vote. So let's start here. Most obviously, a state legislature could impede the right to vote by flatly prohibiting a person or a class of persons from voting, right? A state legislature, for example, could say, if you don't own property, you're not entitled to vote. Or if you're a woman, you're not entitled to vote. Or if your skin color is black, you're not entitled to vote. When a state legislature makes that kind of decision, what the legislature is doing is flatly denying the fundamental right to vote to a category of individuals or an individual based on some characteristic that the legislature has identified. We'll talk in a moment about how the courts treat that kind of claim. Let me just give you a quick preview. They're not kind to those kinds of restrictions, and they shouldn't be. Right. The right to vote in our country is fundamental. And when a state legislature flatly prohibits an individual or a class of individuals from voting, we ought to be deeply concerned about that. So that's one way that state legislatures can restrict the right to vote. Now, state legislatures, knowing that the courts don't look friendly on that kind of categorical ban on the right to vote, what they do is they come up with other clever ways of restricting the right to vote for various classes of individuals. And they do this using what we call second generation barriers to the right to vote. These come under cover of neutral, broadly applicable, the court calls them time, place, and manner restrictions on the right to vote, but nevertheless can have a serious impact on the right to vote for individuals or classes of individuals. In contemporary politics, we might think about things like voter ID requirements, right? A voter ID requirement might impose a burden on an individual voter or a class of voters. It might impose such a burden on an individual or class of voters that it entirely prevents them from voting at the extreme edge of it, right? But nevertheless, this comes under cover of a kind of neutral time, place, and manner restriction on the right to vote that a state will typically justify in the name of preventing voter fraud and ensuring the integrity 
of the elections. When that happens, the courts treat the claim very differently. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the upshot is that the courts will typically allow state legislatures to impose those kinds of restrictions on the right to vote without a ton of scrutiny into what the state legislature is doing, even when there's no or little evidence of voter fraud. So just by way of background, just to kind of get us going, we can talk about these two different kinds of restrictions on the right to vote, an absolute bar or barrier to the right to vote for an individual or class of individuals, and then these so-called second generational barriers to the right to vote that restrict or limit the right to vote in one way or another, but they do it broadly for the entire class of voters in the name of preventing voter fraud. And uh, again, the court will call them something like a time, place, or manner restriction. So, so Steve, right can, I, can I interject with the question? And so is that similar to the Mississippi Project of 1890? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Uh, that was Muriel. Muriel. Yeah. So Muriel, tell me exactly what. The so I had heard something about the Mississippi project of 1890 and it was use those words like integrity, you know, that they, they couldn't say we want to keep black people from voting, but they used ter wor wor terms like in uh, voter integrity and, and exactly. those kind of things. And so is that kind of similar to what you're referring to or no? That's exactly what we're going on, what, what we're talking about. And that happened in, not only in Mississippi, but across the South and even in some locations in the North. After the Civil War, states uh, initially just simply disenfranchised uh, Black people. Um, and that would be a categorical restriction on the right to vote by all members of the class of Black people. Um, we, the people, had an answer to that. It was the 14th Amendment and then later the 15th Amendment, which prohibits voting uh, restrictions based on race. It prohibits a state legislature from enacting a restriction because of somebody's race. And we can think of that as kind of a first generational barrier on the right to vote, right? Those are barriers that are categorical. They have to apply to an entire class of individuals. Um, in this case, the class of black individuals uh, in the reconstruction period and the time after the Civil War. Um, after the 15th Amendment, states said, well, I guess we can't do that anymore because we can't intentionally discriminate against black people. And so what we'll do instead is we'll adopt these second generational barriers, Jim Crow-like barriers to the right to vote that will restrict the right to vote based on a person's ability to pay, right? And so we'll impose a poll tax. And if you can pay the poll tax, you can vote. If you can't pay the poll tax, you can't vote. And you know, somehow magically that meant that all white people get to vote, but all black people didn't. Even poor white people would somehow get a chance to vote where black people wouldn't. Or a state may impose a literacy test, right? Where you have to pass a literacy test in order to vote. And again, sort of magically, all white people would pass the literacy test and black people would fail the literacy test in the state, resulting in disenfranchisement of black people. Or maybe a state would adopt a grandfather clause. This one's really clever. You've undoubtedly heard about grandfather clauses but I don't know that you've heard about them in this context. So a grandfather clause says, if your grandfather can vote, then you can vote, right? And of course, in the post-Civil War era, many Black people's grandfathers, especially in the South, were slaves and couldn't vote. And that meant that those, uh, that those Black individuals couldn't vote either. Now, on the face of it, each of those seems to be a neutral, broadly applicable rule. The court might even call them in today's language a time, place, and manner restriction on the right to vote, right? You got to pay a poll tax. You got to pass a literacy test. You can only vote if your grandfather can vote. But in fact, what we discovered um, is exactly what the states intended. And that is that this disenfranchised black individuals as a class from the right to vote. And so we needed a way to kind of address that 
problem, these second generational barriers to the right to vote that looked on the face of them like neutral voting requirements, but applied in a way that denied the right, of, the right to vote to an entire class of individuals, in this case, black individuals. And just kind of looping back to your uh, original question, Mario. So yeah, we saw this in Mississippi, but we saw it in states across the South. And again, in some states in the North as well. Congress came back with the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which we'll talk about here in a second, to comprehensively address that. But then the Supreme Court in recent years has really undermined the congressional attempt through the Voting Rights Act to, um, to address that, that very problem. Um, so thank you. Yes, that's exactly right. And that's a nice way to kind of tie our history of racial discrimination in the vote with just what, you know, kind of what's going on today, some of which is racial discrimination in the vote, but some of which is partisan discrimination in the vote, and, and some of which, quite frankly, is just states attempts to restrict voting. Um, again, in the name of voting fraud, the problem is we don't often see actual evidence of voting fraud. Um, I see a question came in. A couple of questions came in on chat. I just want to pause and make sure that we're addressing these. So one asks, does this effort by the court to restrict the uh, right to vote in states moves to limit vary over periods of time? Yeah, you know, one of the phenomenons that we see, and this is a really troubling um, trend. And again, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was addressed, uh, designed to address it. We'll, we'll talk about how that works here in a second. But what we see is um, a the, the pattern is a state will adopt a restriction on the right to vote. We'll see a reaction either from Congress or from the courts preventing the state from doing that. And then the state will adopt a different restriction on the right to vote that has a similar impact on a class of voters, uh, oftentimes by race, sometimes by political affiliation or some other classification. It's like a game of whack-a-mole. And, um, and, and again, Congress had an answer to this in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but as we'll see in a second, the Supreme Court sharply undermined that. So part of the answer to the question is yes, absolutely. That's exactly what happens. Um, and part of it, hold on, we'll come back to in a second. Another question came in, would a constitutional amendment to establish an explicit right to vote restrict state and federal government limitations? That's a great question. Um, I think it depends. It depends on how the amendment is worded and how the court interprets it. Again, more to come on that. I'm kind of pausing thinking, how do I address these questions? It's very, very good questions that demand a response. But I'm gonna ask the question or hold on to the question for just a second. And if I don't answer it in what I say about the Voting Rights Act and, and, um, and the right to vote, then loop me back and I'll certainly address it in a second. These are really good questions, thank you. Okay, so having said all that by way of background, let's start with what I'm calling this kind of first dimension, the fundamental right to vote. So the fundamental right to vote operates in two ways in today's doctrine. If a state absolutely bars an individual or a class of individuals from the right to vote by enacting, for example, a poll tax, the court applies a test that we call strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny is the most rigid test known to constitutional law. And what it means is a state legislative effort will almost surely be overturned and ruled unconstitutional in the courts. In other words, if a state enacts a law that categorically bars an individual or a class of individuals from the right to vote, the law will almost surely be struck in the courts. There's one exception to this, and that is felon disenfranchisement. As, uh, as we might have seen if we followed the, the, uh, the Florida debates in recent years, we know that a state can prohibit uh, convicted felons from voting, not only during the period of their incarceration, but for the rest of their lives. 
That seems like a categorical restriction on the right to vote, and it is. But the Supreme Court has given a pass on that one. The Supreme Court has said, if you want to disenfranchise felons and ex-felons, states are permitted to do that. But otherwise, a categorical restriction on the right to vote is almost surely to fail in the courts. Now, the other way that states can restrict a right to vote is through one of these neutral time, place, manner, kind of second generational restrictions on the right to vote. We had mentioned voter ID, so let's go with that for a second. One common way that we're seeing states restrict the right to vote is by enacting voter ID requirements. A voter ID requirement requires voters to show a picture identification of a particular kind when they appear at the polls to vote. If they don't show the picture ID, they're not eligible to vote. Now, the problem with this is a lot of voters have trouble getting a picture ID, a valid picture ID, because, for example, a driver's license in many states requires a passport or a birth certificate or some other document that for a number of individuals is very difficult or expensive to obtain. And so we've seen challenges to state voter ID requirements claiming that an individual or class of individuals is having a hard time getting the necessary documents in order to get a picture identification in order to go and vote. And so we've seen these cases work their way up through the courts. Now, when a state enacts a law like this, a kind of broadly applicable time, place, and manner restriction on the right to vote, the court applies a much lower level test. It's a balancing test. And the balancing test looks on the one hand at the government's interest in the restriction on the right to vote. What's the government's interest in restricting the right to vote in this way? Most typically, a government will assert an interest in preventing voter fraud and ensuring the integrity of the polls, right? Those are the typical interests that we see a government assert. On the other side of the balance, the court will look at the degree of impediment to the right to vote. How much harder does this measure make it for an individual or a class of individuals to vote? In practice, how much harder is it, right? Is it really hard? And if so, that's going to weigh heavily on that side of the scale against the state restriction. Or is it maybe not so hard? And if it's not so hard, then that will weigh much lighter in and more likely uphold the state restriction. The Supreme Court has applied this balancing test most recently in a case called Marion County versus Crawford, a case coming out of Indiana in 2008 dealing with voter ID. Indiana enacted a voter ID law and applied it. Uh, plaintiffs sued and tried to stop the law, and the court applied this balancing test. In the course of applying the balancing test, what the court said was, you know, Indiana has asserted an interest in preventing in-person voter fraud and ensuring the integrity of the polls. Now, it turns out there's really no evidence of in-person voter fraud or any significant in-person voter fraud in Indiana. And there's really no evidence that there's any threat to the integrity of the polls. But what the court said is, we're going to weigh Indiana's asserted interest quite heavily in the balance. We're going to weigh it because we actually take voter fraud quite seriously, even when there's no evidence of voter fraud. On the other side of the scale, what the court said is, the plaintiffs, just as an evidentiary matter, the plaintiffs failed to produce the kind of evidence that Indiana's particular voter ID requirement would really produce an impediment to their right to vote. And that was just a, a problem with the plaintiff's case. Now, what's notable about the case is that the Supreme Court weighed heavily Indiana's interest in preventing voter fraud and ensuring the integrity of the polls, even though there was no evidence of voter fraud at any significant levels in, in Indiana, or no evidence that there, that, the, the, that there was any threat to the integrity of the polls. And so weighing those interests heavily against a lack of evidence to show an impediment on the right to vote, the Supreme Court said that Indiana voter, voter ID law will be upheld under that balancing test. I mention this because in the context of the right to vote, 
under the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause and under the First Amendment, in the context of the right to vote, the Supreme Court has moved in the direction of deferring to the states in their asserted interest when their asserted interest has to do with protecting against voter fraud and ensuring the integrity of the polls. The court weighs that interest quite heavily. What that means then is that plaintiffs in challenging those laws have a really heavy burden to show an actual impediment to the right to vote on behalf of an individual plaintiff or a class of plaintiffs in order to succeed against the state in a challenge to a state's neutral time, place, and manner restriction on the right to vote. And so in this first dimension, in the right to vote dimension, what we've seen is when states move to second generational barriers to the right to vote, the court applies this balancing test. And the balancing test looks like it would be a, um, you know, a, a test that plaintiffs could meet in certain cases, and indeed they can. But at the same time, the court puts a heavy thumb on the scale in favor of the government when the government asserts an interest in preventing voter fraud and ensuring the integrity of the polls, even when there's no evidence of substantial voting fraud or evidence of a threat to the integrity of the polls. And so in this first dimension, we've seen the court move in a way that's, that's looking to actually put a thumb on the scale in favor of state neutral time, place, and manner restrictions on the right to vote. I'm going to pause there just for a second before we talk about the second dimension, racial discrimination, and see if there are any questions based on what I've said so far. Okay, now at this, uh, I'm going to try to, to kind of loop back to the earlier question about the constitutional amendment at this point and see if I can at least partially address that. The, um, the rules that I've just stated uh, come out of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, and some courts find them in the First Amendment. The 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause requires states to provide equal protection of the laws to their citizens. It's an equality demand in our Constitution, maybe um, most famously employed in Brown versus Board of Education. What it means is that states have to treat equally situated people alike. Now, here's where the language of a constitutional amendment becomes important. The way the Supreme Court has interpreted the Equal Protection Clause is to say that the government cannot discriminate by race overtly, but a government can take neutral government action that has the effect of discriminating by race, okay? Now, when we overlay the principle that I just said with first generational voting restrictions and second generation voting restrictions, we can see the implications. A, an amendment that calls for equal protection in the right to vote would probably be interpreted in exactly the same way, that the, um, that the government has to provide uh, equal protection insofar as the government doesn't overtly discriminate in the right to vote. But if the government takes a neutral time, place, and manner restriction on the right to vote, even if it has a disparate impact on the right to vote or a class of individuals' right to vote, the courts would be likely to uphold it. So what we need is a constitutional amendment that is precisely tailored to address second generational problems and barriers to the right to vote, these disparate effect claims. And as we're gonna see here in a second, that's kind of hard to do. And the Supreme Court just this summer might've made it even harder. Here's why. And now we'll talk about the second dimension, racial discrimination and the right to vote. Keeping in mind the first generation overt discrimination in the right to vote and second generation neutral state laws that have a discriminatory effect on the right to vote. Let's talk about what Congress did in 1965 in the Voting Rights Act. Congress did two important things for our purposes. One thing is Congress enacted section two of the Voting Rights Act. And I, I don't wanna get all sectiony on you here, but uh, I mentioned section two by name just so that we can 
keep it kind of categorized as section two, as opposed to another section I'll talk about here in a second. Section two as enacted banned racial discrimination in the vote. Um, the Supreme Court, soon after it was uh, enacted, interpreted Section Two to mean that um, uh, to mean that states were only barred from intentionally discriminating by race in the right to vote. Now, intentional discrimination is a really hard thing for a plaintiff to show. Uh, especially in second generational barriers to the right to vote, right? Let's go back to voter ID. How do you show that voter ID has a, um, has a racial intent? Well, sometimes you can look to legislative history. Sometimes you can look to the effect of the law, but it turns out under the court's doctrine to be really hard to make that kind of case. On the other hand, it's really easy to show when a state overtly discriminates by race that it intended to discriminate by race. If a state, for example, disenfranchises all black people, we know that the state intended to discriminate by race. But again, in 1965, states were way too clever to do that. And they were adopting second generational barriers, which were really tough to show. So the court said that section two applies only to overt discrimination in the right to vote. So Congress came back in 1982 and amended Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Congress amended Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to allow a disparate impact type claim. What this meant was that voting advocates could challenge a state restriction, a neutral time, place, and manner restriction on the right to vote, a second generational restriction on the right to vote, as violating Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because it had a discriminatory impact on a racial group. Um, now, th those claims then after 1982 were going full force and plaintiffs could lodge those kinds of claims. Before I tell you the end of the Section 2 story, I want to tell you about another provision in the Voting Rights Act that was designed to address a particular problem with Section 2. So for all the good, that Section 2 might do in protecting against racial discrimination and the right to vote, both overt racial discrimination and discriminatory impact in the right to vote, there was a fundamental problem with Section 2. It's this. <clears throat> By the time voting rights advocates get around to suing under Section 2 in order to show a racial disparate impact or overt racial discrimination. And by the time they get a ruling from the court, most often the election's already happened. Or if the election hasn't happened, at least the state has adopted the measure that is challenged in the Section 2 litigation. What this means is that, you know, the toothpaste is already out of the tube. And so as powerful as Section 2 is, it can't put that toothpaste back in. The state's already done its work, the election's already happened, and individuals have already been disenfranchised, even if they can sue post hoc to show a Section 2 violation. Congress in 1965 had a really clever answer to this. It was in the second provision of the Voting Rights Act. The second provision is in Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. In Section 5, what Congress required certain states to do is to get permission from the federal government, in particular the Department of Justice, or from a specially convened three-judge federal court to actually get permission, now get this, before the state made any changes to its election law, any changes whatsoever. Here was the theory. <clears throat> States that have a really ugly history of racial discrimination and the right to vote are discovering new and different ways to adopt racially neutral second generation barriers to the right to vote. And section two litigation simply can't keep up. So Congress said, what if we take those jurisdictions, those jurisdictions with a particularly ugly history of voting discrimination, and what if we require them to get federal permission before they make any changes to the right to vote, they have to, they have to present their proposed change to the right to vote to the Department of Justice or the specially convened three-judge court. And DOJ or the court 
will determine whether the proposed change will have a retrogressive effect on racial minority voting rights, right? And if they determine that the proposed change will have a retrogressive effect on those rights, then they'll reject the change. If they instead determine that the change will not have a retrogressive effect on racial minority voting rights, then they'll allow the change to go into effect. What this meant was that jurisdictions, particularly jurisdictions in the South, although there were some in the North as well, jurisdictions that had a particularly ugly history of voting discrimination could no longer play this game of whack-a-mole that we talked about earlier. They could no longer invent new and different second generational barriers to the right to vote that had a racially disparate impact because when they proposed those to the federal government or to this three judge court, they would determine that those proposed changes would have a retrogressive effect on racial minority voting rights and therefore reject the change. Now, this procedure, it's the, called the preclearance procedure, preclearance because states needed to get preclearance before they made any changes to their voting laws. This procedure saved hundreds or even thousands of voting restrictions from going into place in jurisdictions that had a particularly ugly history of vote discrimination prevented them from going into place in the first place so that plaintiffs were no longer playing this game of whack-a-mole. States with an ugly history of voting discrimination were prevented from enacting their laws in the first place to further discrimination. And they were stuck with their laws that they had on the books, some of which were also challenged under Section 2. So this Section 5 preclearance provision was designed to work hand in hand to complement Section 2, understanding that Section 2 litigation necessarily had some shortcomings just because of the, the timeline of an election cycle, and that Section 5 could operate to prohibit states from enacting these discriminatory voting laws in the first place. Now, the way that I've stated the test for Section 5, retrogressive effect, you might have guessed, and if you did, you were right, that Section 5 prohibited states from enacting second generational barriers to the right to vote that had a racially disparate impact. Remember a few minutes ago, I said that in 1982, Congress added a provision to Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act that similarly restricted uh, states from enacting laws that had a racially disparate impact. Well, Section 5 did as well. And so in this way, the two provisions really well complemented each other. Now, Section 2 and Section 5 were doing their job for a long, long time, although both were subject to constitutional challenges, challenges arguing that Congress lacked authority for, for complicated reasons that I'd be happy to go into, but also happy to avoid, if you'd prefer, that Congress lacked authority to enact Section 2 and Section 5. Those challenges were consistently rebuffed in the courts, including the Supreme Court, and again, Section 2 and Section 5 kind of chugged along. That is until 2013, when a case came out of Shelby County, Alabama, which was one of these covered jurisdictions under Section 5, one of these jurisdictions with an ugly history of race discrimination that had to submit its proposed changes to the Department of Justice or three-judge court, Shelby County argued that Congress exceeded its in enforcement power under the 14th Amendment to enact Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. In particular, what Shelby County said was, Congress has gone too far, right? Congress has covered a number of jurisdictions based on a coverage formula in the Voting Rights Act that harkens back to 1965. And what Shelby County said was, things have changed since 1965. A number of jurisdictions in the South really should no longer be covered by this preclearance requirement but Congress nevertheless continues to require us to go through preclearance. That's too much, that's unconstitutional. And in 2013, in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, 
the Supreme Court agreed. What the Supreme Court said was that Section 5 itself didn't necessarily violate the Constitution, but the coverage formula for Section 5 did. That is, the formula that Congress used to determine which jurisdictions had this particularly ugly history of voting discrimination and therefore had to comply with preclearance, that coverage formula itself was out of date, the court said, and therefore unconstitutional. What that meant was that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the preclearance requirement, that remains on the books, but it's a dead letter. There's no coverage formula, and Congress hasn't been able to get it together to reenact a coverage formula that would come up to speed with the realities of today. And so Section 5 preclearance remains on the books, but it's unenforced. Now, interestingly, and just to give you a sense of the, um, well, what Shelby County wrought, the very day that Shelby County came down from the Supreme Court, states that were covered under the preclearance requirement, in particular Texas and North Carolina, they went ahead and enacted restrictions on the right to vote, second generational restrictions, that had been previously upheld, I'm sorry, prevented under the preclearance requirement. So Texas and North Carolina, they saw Shelby County come down, and that very day they enacted legislation that the day before they were prohibited from enacting because it didn't pass the preclearance requirement. The, the legislation would have resulted in a retrogressive effect on racial minority voters in those states. And so the Department of Justice and federal courts had said, you can't enact that. Well, the day that Shelby County came down, they enacted it. And we saw that pattern across the South, where now states are enacting uh, post-2013, these second generational barriers on the right to vote that have a racially disparate impact they would have been held up in the preclearance requirement, but the preclearance requirement is a dead letter in federal law today. More to come on the coverage formula in a second. So let me let me let me interject real quick. Yes, so there's please. a question um, in the chat that says, "How broad is Congress's power to restrict state laws on voting?" So it sounds like they yeah. don't have any power. Yeah, well, uh, Muriel, that's a great point. They, they, it depends on who you talk to, I think. <laughs> so okay. You talk to the Supreme Court, at least today's Supreme Court, and Congress's power is somewhat limited in, uh, in doing this. Um, now, in theory, Shelby County allows Congress to come back and enact a coverage formula that would require certain states to uh, go through preclearance again. Um, and that's actually what the John Lewis Voting Rights Act would do. That's now before Congress. Um, there's a question in the chat about the filibuster and how that's impacting this fight. Yeah, well, that's exactly what's going on with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, Senate Republicans have indicated that they'll filibuster the act in the Senate. And so Democrats are trying to figure out, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate? and pass this with a uh, bare majority Democratic votes? Can we even get a bare majority of Democratic votes to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and reinstate the coverage formula for preclearance under Section 5? That's significant questions. And, um, and we'll have to, you know, that's all kind of unfolding before our very eyes. And we'll just have to keep an eye on that and see how that how that happens. I do think it's an opportunity for us to get involved in politics and press our representatives and, and other representatives to, um, to uh, pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to, to essentially reinstate Section 5 preclearance and put a stop to um, the second generation of voting uh, restrictions that we're seeing all across the country today that have a disparate impact on racial minorities' right to vote. Uh, and we can talk a little bit more about that uh, in a second and in Q&A. Uh, but yeah, this is exactly what the John Lewis Voting Rights Act does. Now, you know, the, the Supreme Court in Shelby County did sort of telegraph, too, that the court does read Congress's authority to enact legislation 
like this um, relatively narrowly. And uh, given changes in the court since 2013, I suspect that the court will move uh, even further in that direction. And so even if Congress could pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, it's not obvious that the Supreme Court would uphold it against a constitutional challenge or would uphold Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act against a Section 5 challenge. Um, how does the Voting Rights Amendment Act uh, modernize the preclearance section? So what it does is simply use a different formula to identify which states and jurisdictions have a, an ugly history of voting discrimination. The, the problem with the, uh, the coverage formula in 2013, according to the Supreme Court, is that it was, um, it was based on a formula based on electoral turnout in, um, in elections in the early 1960s. And the Supreme Court said, you know, that might have worked well uh, for the 1960s, maybe even the 1970s and 80s. But when we get into the 2000s, election turnout is very different, right? Black voters are voting in much greater numbers and at much higher percentages in the 2000s than they did in the 1960s. States have not enacted second generational voting rights um, to, uh, to target racial minority voters in the 2000s. Basically what the court said and literally what the court said is things have changed. Uh, things have changed in the South in particular, the court said, and that um, the Voting Rights Act, if it is going to require preclearance, the Voting Rights Act needs to keep up. And so for modernizing the coverage formula, what, um, what the act will do is look to turnout and state practices more recently than the 1960s. And, um, and that will uh, presumably include uh, some jurisdictions that were pre previously covered, but maybe let other jurisdictions out and maybe cover some new jurisdictions that weren't previously covered because they now have a, um, an ugly history of race discrimination. Um, and so that's how uh, the John Lewis Act would modernize the preclearance uh, section. But again, I, it's not at all obvious that the Supreme Court would uphold that modernization or would uphold Section 5 itself against a constitutional challenge. So as a result of Shelby County, since 2013, the uh, voting rights advocates are left with Section 2, right? Section 2 litigation to challenge state action as having a disparate impact on racial minority voters. Well, the Supreme Court all but put a stop to that just this past summer in a case called Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, a case coming out of Arizona, dealing with two second generational Arizona voting restrictions. One was a so-called out of precinct restriction, which said that if a voter votes out of their precinct, their vote will be discarded even for offices that they would be entitled to vote for, like statewide offices. The other provision was a ballot collection ban, which banned people, with certain exceptions, banned people from collecting other people's ballots and then submitting them all together at a vote location. Um, the reason that that one was important is because uh, many Native American um, voters in, uh, in Arizona, especially in rural locations, used ballot collection as a way to make voting easier for them when, they, when a voting site was not readily accessible uh, to those communities. Plaintiffs challenged the out of precinct policy and the vote, uh, the ballot collection ban under section two of the Voting Rights Act as a second generational barrier on the right to vote with a disparate impact on racial minority voters, in particular Latinx voters, Native American voters, and even black voters in Arizona. And, um, and had good evidence that, uh, good statistical evidence that these practices did have 
a racially disparate impact. The court ruled against them. What the court said was that the, um, that the Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act does indeed uh, prohibit discriminatory impact uh, practices, uh, voting second generational practices that have a discriminatory impact by race on particular populations. And so the court acknowledged that the sort of disparate impact theory was a viable theory for voting rights advocates. But then it took a sharp turn and narrowed the, uh, the ability of plaintiffs to bring this kind of disparate impact claim. In particular, what the court said was, we're gonna look at a number of different factors in evaluating a disparate impact claim. And one of the factors that the court identified that I think maybe is the most troubling is that it said, we're going to compare the voting practice that is at issue with the voting practices of the state in 1982. You might ask, well, why 1982? The reason 1982 is because, remember, it was 1982 that Congress amended Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to authorize these disparate impact claims. And so the court pegged 1982 as the benchmark against which to measure current voting practices. Well, the problem with that is that since 1982, our voting practices have changed radically, right? In every state, they've changed dramatically. In particular, every state has opened up the right to vote in ways that we never could have anticipated back in 1982. So states have opened up the registration, states have opened up the right to vote, states have opened up every aspect of voting as compared to a 1982 benchmark. Now, that factor alone virtually ensures that today almost any restriction on the right to vote as measured by the 1982 benchmark is gonna be upheld, right? Because it still protects a greater right to vote than we had in 1982. The other factors similarly counseled against disparate impact claims and made it much, much harder today to file disparate impact claims than it was before the Brnovich case came down. So the effect of Shelby County and the Brnovich case together is to first eviscerate Section 5 preclearance, and then second, to sharply limit the way that plaintiffs can bring disparate impact claims under Section 2. So not, now, not only is Section 2, does it have its inherent deficiencies because it's not complemented by Section 5 preclearance, but it also has this additional deficiency that the court read into it in the Brnovich case, making it much, much harder to bring these disparate impact kinds of claims. And so just like in the first dimension, the right to vote, where we saw the court apply this balancing test in a way that put a heavy thumb on the scale of state restrictions on the right to vote, so too in interpreting the Voting Rights Act and racial discrimination in the right to vote, the court has now put a heavy, almost determinative thumb on the scale of the state and state restrictions, second generational restrictions on the right to vote, as against claims that those restrictions violate uh, violate the Voting Rights Act. So again, I'm going to pause here for just a second. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I see it's already eight o'clock. I do want to mention one more dimension, uh, but I also want to pause and see if there are any questions. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, one question, what's the legal theory that the Supreme Court says Congress doesn't have the power? That's a really good question. That's a highly technical question and a highly technical answer. I'm going to try to simplify it as much as I can. The um, 14th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, again, uh, provides that states have to provide equal protection to citizens. They, it's an equality principle. They have to treat equally situated people the same. That's not a self-enforcing uh, provision. What that means is <clears throat> in order for it to have uh, legal teeth, Congress has to enact legislation to enforce it. And as it turns out, Congress can do that under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. That's different than Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. 
Now we're talking about Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. Section 5 of the 14th Amendment authorizes Congress to enact legislation to enforce the provisions of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. In other words, to enforce the Equal Protection Clause. Well, here's the problem. Remember I said earlier that the court has interpreted the Equal Protection Clause itself to ban overt racial discrimination, but not to ban neutral state policies that have a discriminatory effect. If Congress is enforcing the Equal Protection Clause, then the question is, can Congress enforce the Equal Protection Clause against neutral state action that has a discriminatory impact, even if neutral state action that has a discriminatory impact is not itself a violation of the Equal Protection Clause? That's a really hard question. And uh, the Supreme Court has in the past said, yes, Congress can do that. But the way the court has moved, the personnel on the court, uh, suggests that the court might not rule that same way today. The court very well might rule that Congress, in enforcing the Equal Protection Clause, cannot go beyond the Equal Protection Clause. And the Equal Protection Clause itself only bans overt intentional racial discrimination. What that would mean, then, is that Congress in banning racially disparate impact has exceeded its authority in enacting legislation to enforce the Equal Protection Clause. And that's the technical piece of why congressional action would be unconstitutional. Now, you might know that Congress is considering the John Lewis Act, we talked about that. It's also considering the For the People Act, which would require all kinds of different changes and, and impose all kinds of uh, restrictions and, and changes on states in, uh, in the way that they operate the right to vote. When Congress is considering the For the People Act, it's pointed to the 14th and 15th Amendments, to be sure, but it's also pointed to, uh, it's also pointed to other provisions in the Constitution that authorize the Congress to regulate elections for federal offices. So, for example, the Elections Clause. The Elections Clause gives primary authority first to the states to regulate the time, place, and manner of elections. But it says Congress can impose regulations if it wants to. And so Congress, in considering the For the People Act, has pointed to the Elections Clause as a source of authority that might allow it to impose some restrictions on states in imposing these second generational barriers on the right to vote. Congress has also pointed to the Republican Form of Government Clause. The Republican Form of Government Clause is a constitutional clause that protects a Republican form of government for the states and authorizes Congress to enact legislation to pr protect a Republican form of government for the states. The, uh, that doesn't mean Republican as in political party Republican. What it means is Republican as in we vote for our elected representatives and those representatives make policy decisions on our behalf. Um, Congress has pointed to the Republican form of government clause as a source of authority for some of the provisions and for the, the For the People Act. And so there may be other ways that Congress could argue that it has authority to restrict racially disparate impact um, practices by the states. But the principal way that Congress is doing this is under its enforcement authority under the 14th Amendment. And today there is some significant question about whether this Supreme Court in 2021, as currently comprised, would uphold Congress's authority to enact such legislation. It's probably way, way more than <laughs> the questioner wanted to know. And I'm sorry about that, but it's, it's a complicated question, an outstanding question, but a complicated one with a complicated answer. The last dimension that I wanted to put on your radar screen is redistricting. Um, in redistricting, which states now have started in reaction to the 2020 census, which itself had all kinds of problems, uh, as we may remember, states have now started to redraw state legislative districts and uh, state house districts, congressional districts, now obviously not, not uh, US Senate districts. 
but, uh, but other districts. And in doing so, they're going to, um, uh, many states are likely to do two, two things. One is to redistrict in a way that advantages the political party that's in power in the state legislature and the governor's mansion. That's political gerrymandering. Um, this is a tried and true method of reinforcing political power over the course of the next 10 years that state legislatures of both parties have engaged in uh, widely over the course of our country's history. Now, political gerrymandering, um, if you think about it, disenfranchises a good number of voters, right? And that's because in political gerrymandering, what state legislatures have to do is pack voters of a particular party into a minority of districts and crack voters of that party across other districts in a way that will produce a majority of districts that allow the majority party in the state legislature to retain control in a disproportionate way, disproportionate to the popular vote in the state. That's the whole point of political gerrymandering. When a state legislature does that, it necessarily disenfranchises some voters in a district because it has packed them or cracked them in a way that makes their vote essentially meaningless in the district. Voting rights advocates have challenged this on exactly that theory and challenged it all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court ruled in 2019 in a case called Rucho, R-U-C-H-O, that these claims are non-justiciable. What that means is the courts won't hear them. The court said, we don't really have a good way of determining when a political gerrymander goes too far. And because we don't have a good way of determining that, we're simply not going to deal with these cases at all. We're going to leave it to the state legislatures and to Congress if Congress wants to intervene, but we're not going to deal with it. In other words, what the Supreme Court did was not only to allow, but to invite state legislatures to engage in extreme partisan gerrymandering. Um, and again, we're seeing this happen now on, uh, on both sides of the political aisle in different states. Um, the For the People Act, incidentally, the Federal Act, the Congressional Act now before Congress, would require states to use a nonpartisan or bipartisan uh, electoral commission to draw these districts in a nonpartisan or bipartisan way to eliminate or reduce political gerrymandering. But again, that's just legislation right now. Um, it would have to pass both the House and the Senate where it would face the, the Senate Republicans filibuster. And it's not even certain that the bill would get a bare majority of Democrats, even if the Democrats were to do away with the filibuster in the Senate. So political gerrymandering, we're going to see that a lot in the next few months over the course of the next year. The second thing that many states will be doing when they redistrict is to have a racially disparate impact in the way that they redistrict. In other words, states won't redistrict in a way that overtly discriminates by race, but states are likely to redistrict in a way that has a racially disparate impact. That's because race in our country in many locations closely correlates with party affiliation. And so when state legislatures redistrict based on partisan objectives, they also are redistricting based on race. In other words, even if they're not saying that they're redistricting by race, the effect is to redistrict by race in many locations in the country. What the Supreme Court has said about racial discrimination, we already know, right? It's really hard or near impossible to lodge a racial disparate impact claim in any context, and certainly not uh, racially gerrymandering contexts. And so the Supreme Court has all but foreclosed those kinds of claims as well. Even when those claims are viable, really all a state legislature has to show is that the state legislature would have districted in exactly the same way if it were based on only pure partisan concerns without considering race at all, and the state legislature can prevail. 
And so the picture doesn't look good in that third dimension either with regard to gerrymandering. Uh, For the People Act can address this, but again, there are some issues with the For the People Act getting passed. Now, having said all that, what we're seeing across the states is a ton of action to restrict the right to vote. Everything was from uh, restrictions on physically voting, things like voter ID, changing up voter locations, restricting voting locations, to limits to voting by mail or absentee voting, restricting drop box places for absentee and, and, uh, and vote by mail, restrictions on helping people vote, not only ballot collection restrictions, but also restrictions on on helping people with language and language access barriers to the right to vote and physical access barriers to the right to vote for individuals with disabilities or different abilities, states clamping down on helping voters vote, Um, limits on in-person voting, again, voter ID laws or physical limits on the time of voting and the locations of voting, Um, uh, restrictions based on poll watchers. We're seeing this in Texas and some other states where the state legislature is allowing poll watchers and actually limiting poll workers' ability to restrict poll watchers. Now, poll watchers are just people who come in to observe polling, which they're typically permitted to do. But in this instance, what Texas and other jurisdictions are doing is allowing poll watchers to come in and really intimidate voters and limiting the ability of election officials to restrict poll watchers from that kind of intimidation. And then finally, on the very extreme ends of things, we're seeing state legislatures adopt laws that would allow a state legislature to actually intervene and cast electoral votes in the electoral college in a way that goes against the popular vote in the state. That's a direct result of some of the claims that we've seen come out of the 2020 presidential election. And if state legislatures move forward with this and these actions, actions against this kind of thing do not succeed in the courts, this could have profound impacts on the 2024 presidential election. So stay tuned with regard to some of these restrictions. They're very troubling and, uh, and can have profound impacts. Now, having said all this, what can we do? Well, we as citizens can instigate for the For the People Act and for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, right? We can obviously call and lobby our own state, our own uh, members of Congress and senators and, um, and the president. Uh, we can uh, lobby other members of Congress uh, and members of the Senate uh, and the president and encourage them to, uh, to pass that legislation by whatever means they need to, whether that's by overcoming a filibuster, doing away with a filibuster or what have you. Uh, so those are some tangible things that, that we can do to express our voice. We can also take action on the state level. We can look to our state legislature and state government to protect voting rights in ways that um, that we see other states attacking them. Now, in Illinois, we're pretty lucky. We've got pretty free and open voting rights that are typically not under attack. One thing that we do see in Illinois, though, that we talked about is political gerrymandering and really extreme political gerrymandering. In Illinois, it favors tends to favor Democrats, uh, whereas in other states, we see it favoring Republicans. There is a move in Illinois to change from legislative redistricting to an independent commission redistricting. And if you feel strongly about political gerrymandering, you can throw your voice behind that effort and try to get uh, the state to move in the direction of an independent commission to redraw electoral boundaries. So those are some tangible things that we can do. What I tell my students, um, perhaps the most tangible thing that we can do is actually vote and get our friends to vote and get everybody else to vote and go out and register people to vote and just turn out and vote. Because where change is really made here is at the state legislative level, through Congress, whatever the court says. 
and that uh, that we can actually impact the direction of policy with regard to the right to vote and other areas if we exercise our right to vote and our right to speak and uh, and try to influence things at the local, national, and uh, and state levels. So there are some questions that came in on chat. We still have a couple of minutes for open Q and A and discussion. Let's see uh, where we are here. So what can we do at the polls? In other words, if we are election judges, can we monitor and report intimidation of voters? So that's a great question. And it's, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna partially punt on it. Uh, it's gonna depend on the state where you are. So some states actually are moving pretty aggressively to limit the ability of election judges to monitor and, and report poll watchers. Um, we're seeing that with the Texas legislation, for example, that was signed into law yesterday. Other states uh, will allow and perhaps even require election judges to, uh, to report that kind of activity. And so you wanna take your lead from the advice that you're getting in your training as an election judge and from state and local law and, um, and what they're telling you uh, at the state and local level. Um, there are requests to institute voter ID here in Illinois. Yeah, um, and you know, the voter ID trend, I think uh, my own view is it's not a particularly helpful thing. Um, it's, it's basically a, a solution in search of a problem and creates an unnecessary hassle to, uh, to the right to vote. Um, having said that, the way some states have designed their voting ID laws, they really have minimized the hassle. And so kudos to them for that. And, um, and if Illinois can consider a voter ID law that minimizes or eliminates the hassle entirely, well, then maybe voter ID is, is, not, uh, is not such a bad thing having a solution in search of a problem if the solution is, uh, is itself not a problem um, may, not, uh, may not be a problem. The, the, um, I'll tell you just as a personal issue, what, what, I, what I dislike about the voter ID trend is that it assumes that there is a voter fraud problem, an in-person voter fraud problem. And to the extent that we continue to parrot that claim, we actually undermine the integrity of our electoral process. And to the extent that we undermine the integrity of our electoral process, states have now another reason to enact voter ID. In other words, this is a kind of self-perpetuating process and, um, and I, I actually worry quite a bit about that with regard to voter ID and other restrictions on the right to vote. To the extent that we permit states to enact restrictions on the right to vote that effectively are a, a solution in search of a problem, we actually validate the problem, right? And create a kind of public discourse and public uh, consciousness around that problem that then gives states a reason to enact further restrictions on the right to vote. And so we sort of build a uh, phantom problem upon phantom problem in a way that further and further restricts our right to vote. And I, I kind of worry about that slippery slope. Um, I think, we've addressed all the, all the questions in chat. If other folks have any other questions. Diane, did you have any, Diane Orr? Did you have any questions that you wanted to, uh, in our last few minutes, we have like what, six minutes? So um, Shayla, if you can unmute um, Diane. So there's a, a really interesting question in chat. Um, first off, I do I th thank you for your kind comments. I appreciate that. It, as I said, it really is a pleasure to be with you. Um, an interesting question in chat. Do you have any information about how For the People Act is being skinned 
Uh, actually, I'm getting an unstable connection as I'm saying that. I hope you're hearing me okay. Yeah, we're hearing. The, um, the skinnier version. I'm confess my ignorance on this one. What does skinned mean? Skinny. What is what skinnier it, version? A skinnier version. It ver would be the skinnier uh, version. Okay. Yes, that's what. Yeah, what was no, I don't have any information on that, but I will say, um, I will say this: the For the People Act is ginormous, and as I'm talking, um, I'm going to pull up a primer on this. The Brennan Center calls it an annotated guide to the For the People Act. I'm going to drop the link in um, chat to the Brennan Center uh, summary of the act. Um, this is a monster. It includes everything from independent commissions for redistricting to uh, changes to campaign finance reform to disclosure requirements for campaign contributions. Uh, it, it includes sort of everything under the sun. Getting the votes together to pass that kind of bill is going to be especially challenging, right? Um, given what the bill is trying to do and the concern of many that, uh, that many of these provisions infringe on so-called state sovereignty and states' rights to direct their own electoral practices. Um, one solution to that problem is to divide it up, right? Divide it up into pieces, parts, and allow Congress to adopt the bill in parts as opposed to as a whole. Um, that could allow coalitions to come together that might agree on independent redistricting commissions, for example, but may not agree on campaign finance reform. And so to pass a provision requiring states to use independent redistricting commissions, but not campaign finance reform. And that seems, um, you know, uh, appealing, but the politics of that, I've got to say, are way above my pay grade. Um, and I don't know, uh, I just don't know how, you know, how feasible or viable that kind of strategy would be in, um, in this context. And I don't have any particular inside information about whether and how that might happen. But if you look at the Brennan Center site, you'll, you'll see what a monster this bill is. It, it really is comprehensive. And when we think about the For the People Act alongside of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, the reforms here really are quite significant. Um, every bit as significant as the Voting Rights Act in 1965. These are huge, huge changes. Any other questions, Diane? Um, if we have time, I have a couple, two more questions. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you spoke of the American Constitution Society, the ACS, and some of us are concerned that words such as constitution have become red flag terms and have been hijacked by the right. So uh, what does it mean for the ACS to call itself progressive? Is it nonpartisan or, <laughs> or what? <laughs> great, great, great question. I'm, I'm not laughing at the question. I'm, la I'm, I'm chuckling uh, sure. because the ACS is uh, hyper self-consciously nonpartisan. Um, but, I, but having said that, uh, you know, the reality of today's constitutional politics is that your, your view, one's view on the Constitution um, invariably uh, places you with one party or the other. Uh, I think that's unfortunate, but, um, but it's a reality of today's discourse. Um, has the right uh, co-opted um, or owned the term constitution. You know, this is one of the things I worry a lot about. I'm really glad you raised it. I actually talk, talk to my kids a lot about because one of the things that they've noticed is that our friends on the political right seem to own not only the term constitution, but also the American flag itself. Uh, 
Yes. Um, which I, you know, think is deeply disturbing. Um, the those terms, those symbols, uh, they belong to all of us, and I think we all ought to feel free to use them. Um, I understand what you're saying about the term constitution. The ACS, uh, you know, named itself, I think, before uh, before um, the constitution uh, was started to be affiliated with uh, conservative politics. Um, but uh, but they stand by their uh, their name. So the the president, by the way, if this gives you any indication, the president is former Senate former Wisconsin Senator Russ Feingold. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, it, mm-hmm. that's a fair and fantastic question. You know, the, if you if if you don't know and you may not, that there's a um, there is a real both academic and practical uh, debate over the future of the Constitution. Um, and it's waged uh, in, in large part behind the scenes between the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. The mm-hmm. Federalist Society is a politically conservative organization. And you may remember that the Federalist Society was um, a key player in identifying potential judicial appointments in the Trump administration. The American Constitution Society is a progressive organization, uh, or at least promotes a progressive interpretation of the Constitution, and um, and is a key player in judicial politics in, uh, in the Biden and Obama administrations. And so these two organizations are uh, engaged in a, in 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 really what is an is a is a battle over how we ought to understand the Constitution. Um, it's a friendly battle, and we have friendly debates all the time, but they are sharp debates, as you might imagine, uh, and really important ones. Um, I would urge everybody uh, to learn more about that uh, those organizations um, and to join one or the other. Uh, or both, uh, depending on on what your feelings are about the Constitution. Um, I always urge my friends to do that, my my students to do that, uh, just because both organizations do such an outstanding job uh, with public education and promoting um, a robust debate over the Constitution. I'd like to ask for our indulgence with our, our people who are, have, have joined us. We just have a few more questions. And so if you feel like you need to leave, we understand that you need to leave. Um, not, you know, we just have some closing um, things afterwards, but please stay with us because there's only one or two more questions. Diane, you had one more you said? Um, I did. I don't know if I'm backtracking, but what is your perspective on Senator Klobuchar's effort to host field hearings of the Senate Rules Committee in some states? Yeah, I I mean, I'll I'll tell you for myself, I think that's a fantastic idea. It's, you know, I don't know what Senator Klobuchar's motivation is. Um, It could be anything from pure politics to really serious constitutional thinking about holding these field hearings. But as a constitutional scholar, I approach it through a constitutional lens. My interpretation of what she's doing is getting on the ground field reports of the actual effects of second generational barriers to the right to vote. That's critically important as Congress considers federal legislation that reacts to second generational barriers to the right to vote. It's important because it gets first person uh, testimony about how these second generational barriers affect different populations. But it's important too, because remember when we were talking about congressional authority to enact the preclearance provision in section five of the Voting Rights Act Mm -hmm. and the coverage formula that goes with it. When Klobuchar goes out to the field and hears direct testimony from voters who have been impacted by second generational barriers to the right to vote, what she's doing is compiling a congressional record that a particular jurisdiction has a history of second generational barriers to the right to vote that have a disparate impact by race. Mm 
In other words, she's compiling a congressional record that will then support Congress's authority to require that jurisdiction to submit to preclearance. So whether she intends to do this or not, I suspect that she does intend to do it because she's very, very smart. Um, but whether she intends to do it or not, she actually, these, these moves are actually very astute constitutional moves to help support Congress's later claim in litigation that it has authority to enact something like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act uh, because she's compiling a congressional record of the actual disparate impact of second generational voting rights in particular jurisdictions. So it's, it's actually, I, I think, actually quite brilliant of her to do this. So why, why do you think she is the only senator doing it? I don't imagine she can hit all 50 states. And what if we all volunteered to help her in this movie? Is that possible? Wow, what a great idea. Um, it certainly is possible. I don't know, you know, I don't know enough about her plans to know how, how, how sort of citizen participation could fit with that. Um, well, but it's, but yeah. it, 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 does, it doesn't, it, you know, certainly doesn't strike me as crazy. It uh, seems we, right on. We can ask, I mean, you know, yeah, you can you know, ask. Students, it's a really good question. What I tell my students is that whenever con Congress enacts legislation, particularly under the 14th Amendment, Congress has to do its homework. What I mean by that is Congress actually has to compile a record that it's enforcing the Equal Protection Clause or whatever provision of the 14th Amendment it seeks to enforce. And that record includes a record of violations of the provision that it's seeking to enforce. So the mm -hmm. more evidence that Congress has of actual violations of the Equal Protection Clause, the better Congress is situated to enact the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and revitalize Section 5 uh, preclearance. Um, and you know, to the extent that we can help with that, that's awesome. Um, you know, technically how we do that, uh, that's a different question. I think we need to, to check with Senator Klobuchar's office and um, see what her strategy is. At, let's wrap up with one last question. And I'm not sure if this is a question for you or do we need to check with our county clerk? But it has to do with signatures. And so sometimes as people age and as some, we don't always sign our names the same way all the time. Yeah. And when people, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, putting your signature to vote. So do you have any feedback on that? Or is that something that we need to check with our county clerk or what's your thought? Yeah. So uh, signature requirements in jurisdictions that do have um, a signature requirement and require a match. Um, for voters whose signatures have changed, you know, for any variety of different reasons, uh, it's important that voters update their signatures with uh, the Secretary of State or whoever is keeping the voting rolls in their jurisdiction. Um, many states and jurisdictions will allow a voter to submit what's called a provisional ballot in that situation. A provisional ballot it says, um, I'm, you know, I'm Steve Schwinn, I'm who I say, I am. My, my either picture ID or my signature doesn't match, but I'm going to go ahead and submit my ballot. You're going to hold on to it until I'm able to report to the Secretary of State's office and demonstrate that I actually am who I say I am, right? And when I do that, then my, my provisional ballot will become a counted ballot and count. And so, um, and so provisional balloting is a way around changed signatures and around uh, voter ID requirements. And yeah, I see a comment in chat, I don't sign my name the same way every time. I don't either. And I worry about that when I go to vote. Um, so far, I've kind of skated by because the election officials <laughs> have been kind of generous in, in uh, comparing my signatures, but um, you know, that might not always be the case and I may end up having to submit a provisional ballot. All righty. Well, were there, are there anything that you, any comments or things that you would like to leave us with? Yes, one. 
I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity. It has been such a delight and pleasure and honor. I told the organizers that working with chapters of the League of Women Voters is my favorite professional thing to do. I only regret that we can't do this in person and that you have to see my messy office in the background. Um, I put my email in chat earlier. I'm going to type it again right now and just drop you my email. If you'd like to follow up, please feel free. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but I do want to thank um, I do want to thank Anne and Muriel and all the organizers and all the participants in today's session. It really has been quite an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been very informative and we truly appreciate your uh, time with us this evening. Uh, for our participants, we're going to share uh, my screen one more time. So if by chance you wanted to see um, this particular um, webinar again, hold on, come on, there we go. So if you want to view the recordings, of, of uh, you can review them at the following sites. And so the League of Women Voters, Champaign County um, has a YouTube channel. Um, you can view all three of the series there. I've typed something, but it doesn't, I don't think that's, that's the correct letters, but I think they're supposed to be lowercase. So it's lwbchampaigncounty.org, and that will get you to the League of Women Voters. It'll also be on the NARC's Facebook page, as well as Epsilon, Epsilon Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority's Facebook page as well. And so if by chance someone wants to view this again, or they want to share it with someone, you could go to those sites um, to get the information. And then thank you for joining us on this journey to protect the vote. Um, it's very important to us. And even though this was a three-part series, oh, we're not gone. We'll be back with some more things, but maybe not a series, but we'll be back with more additional information um, as we move closer to the 2022 elections, because we know those are very important. So if there is nothing else for this evening, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, have a blessed evening and stay safe. Thank you. Good night.